What's up, everybody? This is Fred Bracciani of TSC News right here in MNN. On this Throwback Thursday, we're going to throw it back to our most memorable conversations with WWE Hall of Famer, good old JR Jim Ross, the legendary pro wrestling broadcaster. You may have heard him on the WWE Mae Young Classic with Lita. He's also the weekly voice of New Japan on Access TV. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this trip down memory lane. JR, how's it going, man? Fred, if I was any better, I'd probably be twins. And I'm, I'm good, and I thank you for having me on. It's nice to have maybe like one kind of, I guess, like Walter White character, where you know some good, some bad, somebody that's a little more dynamic. But when, when, when one week you, you think a guy's a face, the next week a guy's a heel. I mean, is it a problem? Do you think in today's wrestling? Well, uh, it's, it's really a philosophical situation. I, I think that just for me, I still like the good versus evil. Uh, you know, you, and I think that we see that in, 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 uh, so many major, uh, mainstream sports is, uh, which is why, uh, you know, the home team normally would be considered the baby faces and the visitors are normally considered the heels. And I think people enjoy that. I think people enjoy being extremely exuberant and positive about who they like. And I think they have as much fun uh, investing that emotion in who they don't like. And I remember uh, back in the day uh, when the horsemen, the four horsemen, were at their at their prime and in their prime and at their peak. Uh, fans, I thought, I from my experience of broadcasting, you know, a litany of their matches, fans enjoyed booing the horsemen. It was fun. And then it morphed into, well, they got so comfortable with it, they started cheering them. Uh, and I know that the, the horsemen getting cheers was not, was not something that they uh, embraced. Because when you're a true wrestling villain, you want to be booed. That's your, you want, that's, that's your job. Uh, but in today's world, especially in WWE, that line is very thin. I would like to see the line a little bit more uh, pronounced. But uh, as long as, as the open boater saying goes, there's an ass every 18 inches, meaning there's, a, there's somebody in every seat, it doesn't really matter. I don't, I don't know that it does. Uh, but I, it, just from the simple sake of uh, performance and the guys strategically putting their matches together, to have a definitive fan favorite and a definitive villain sometimes makes that process a little bit easier, makes it easier to game plan. How are you spending your Austin 316 day? <laughs> My Austin 316. March 16th? I saw that question <laughs> on Twitter. I got a kick out of it. Well, I tell you, I have uh, I have turned over a new leaf. Normally, I would go out in Steve's honor today and, and, and have a beer just for the simple sake of celebrating uh, Austin 316 day. But I have... Uh, Embarked on this uh, uh, new diet, new training regimen, and I, I haven't had a drink since the uh, the socially nothing since uh, Royal Rumble, the day after the weekend I saw you uh, back in January, and I have uh, gone on this crazy. Uh, it's not crazy, it's just smart really, but I'm not. Uh, you knowing how I eat, knowing how I was raised, no fried food. No bread, no milk, no, uh, no sugar. So I'm uh, trying to get healthier. And, uh, you know, when you get a little older, you, I, I feel great. I, I've got a trainer. I'm going to the gym five days a week, uh, working out with my trainer three days a week, doing cardio two days a week extra. I have never felt better in in years. But uh, so where I would normally go celebrate uh, the 316 day with Steve, I've already sent him my happy 316 day text. So uh, I may talk to him later today. Depends on how busy he is with his podcast uh, and how busy I am with my podcast. We both uh, stay pretty busy with our with our projects. And uh, but so I will. I normally will have a cold beer today. I just had a uh, best wishes and a, and a good old hello. We talk all the time, so it's not like we're not uh, in touch. Is there a pro wrestling equivalent of the top of your head of a guy like Rafael Dos Anjos, a dude that maybe 
well, it was solid, not necessarily great, and over the course of a couple years, totally turns his career around. Well, you can go all the way back to, uh, yeah, you, there's a lot of guys that, uh, that it, it's more prominent, Fred, in the territory days than it is that I can think of off the top of my head in the modern days. Uh, uh, and, and then maybe somebody's going to pop in my mind, but, you know, you'd see guys in the territory days come through as a prelim guy. And an example is like Hulk Hogan came, where he worked all these little territories in Pensacola and Memphis and places like that. Uh, and, and, and about the only thing he had going for him was uh, a, an amazing look and a, and a uh, you know, a, a, a bright orange tan. But he he learned from those territories and learned how to be Hulk Hogan. He, he knew that he was only going to, he was, there were certain things that he was going to be able to do really well and there certain things that he was going to stay away from. And he was smart enough to refine those, uh, those two philosophies. But if you look at him, you know, arguably one of the greatest ever in the business as an attraction, uh, he, he, he can't, he, he came miles. He came from being a guy that had to be led by a real good heel or a real good baby face, depending on his on Hogan's role, to becoming uh, the 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 biggest star in in that one uh, era of uh, anybody in the business. Just learning. So, uh, but some guys are just some guys just develop late. I mean, you know, they just they, they develop. Late. I remember Ken Shamrock was that way. Ken Shamrock came in, had some good uh, fundamental skills. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have Kenny, I think it's next week, on my podcast. Uh, and we talk a lot about this, but Ken got some amateur rushing training from a guy named Nelson Royal, who's a tough old son of a gun. Uh, and, uh, and, and and then, then Kenny got into the, the fighting. And then he came back to, and then we hired him. I hired him under my watch, and he was just really turning the corner. You know, he was well known to be the referee for the Austin uh, Bret Hart match at WrestleMania 13. But he was starting to really turn the corner and I think would have been one of WWE's uh, biggest stars. But he had the itch to get back in the fighting game. So uh, he, he made this acceleration because of his natural athleticism and his aptitude. And got really, really good. And a lot of people don't remember, or not old enough to remember how how he how dominant he could have been, and he was at times in the uh, in the in the ring for WWE. But just as he was about to touch the promised land uh, and move there permanently, he he uh, came to me and said, "I want to go back to uh, fighting, and it's just in my blood. My I can't get it out of my system, and I got some pretty good opportunities." So. You know, we helped facilitate his uh, departure reluctantly, but uh, he's another guy that just became, came in at, with a name. The world's most dangerous man was perfect for pro wrestling, but uh, his technique and his style became much more uh, refined as time went on. So, uh, but that's how that did. What heck, you can look at Steve Austin. Austin was an underutilized guy that was basically a tag team guy more often than not in WCW. Got hurt, goes to the ECW, and that's how he can cut promos that they didn't even realize he could do because he'd never had the opportunity to do that. He wasn't cast that way in uh, WCW. And I hired him because I thought he had something. And I didn't know how it was going to manifest itself, but uh, luckily enough, it's like one of those recruits where you take this guy's not a quote unquote five star guy, but like Sam Bradford. Sam Bradford was a two-star guy, ended up being the first pick of the draft. So you never know how uh, the learning curve, where, where people are going to, the light bulb is going to go on and they get it. And you're talking about Steve Austin, how you know some people d- didn't give him a chance at first and everything. One of the big talking points of the show I went to, that, that you hosted and, and did a great job with, is it doesn't matter necessarily what a guy looks like, how big, how tall, how small they are. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the criteria for somebody getting over is, is getting over. At the end of the day, if they have the talent, you should at least give them a chance. And you brought up Mick Foley. 
You know, who's probably the best example of that. And I'm looking at NXT right now in 2015. And look, we could say what we want about the main roster and if Daniel Bryan should be the main event, whatever. But you look at the NXT, you have Kevin Owens on top. He doesn't exactly have the best body. He's in shape, not exactly the best body. He's on top. He's the current NXT champion. You got Sami Zayn, not exactly a muscle head by any stretch of the imagination. You got Finn Balor, Adrian Neville, great physiques, not exactly, you know, big, tall, six foot four guys. With yep. NXT, it seems like they're taking a much more open-minded approach. And I don't know if you heard, it looks like they're trying to run some house shows now, not just within the Florida area and during special events like, say, Mania or the Arnold, but making it an actual touring brand similar to ECW was nearly a decade ago for WWE, albeit hopefully more successful. Do you think this is a, a good approach for NXT? And, and do you think that this open-mindedness that we're seeing with Paul Levesque and his approach is one that's going to translate to the main roster down the road when he comes in power? Well, uh, I tell you, Fred, Paul Levesque is a true student of the game. He's been a lifelong fan. He studied it. He's a historian in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, was always a very bright guy. I remember when I was in charge of talent relations, and I would have any uh, number of uh, issues, big or small, with the click. Uh, Paul was always my, he was always the ambassador. He was the level-headed one, you know. He was the guy that didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs, just ate, slept, breathed wrestling. Uh, so he's he's a very very versed and very well aware of the history of the business. If you take everybody uh, in the history of wrestling uh, under six feet tall and eliminate them from the process, eliminate them from the history books, you would eliminate some of the greatest stars that the business has ever known. And so I think that are there are guys like Paul Levesque that understand that. I mean, Dick the Bruiser was 5'9". Uh, Buddy Rogers was 5'10". Uh, Bruno San Martino was 5'10", maybe, 5'11", something like that. Uh, and there are dozens of guys that you can leave out, of, you leave out of that equation. But point being is that you do not have to be six feet tall to, uh, or over six feet to be a star. It's the it factor. It's the char char charisma. Chris Jericho's not six feet tall. Uh, Dolph Ziggler, I don't think, is six feet tall. Daniel Bryan certainly isn't six feet tall. So I think WWE, to answer your question, yes, I think they're relaxing uh, their uh, unwritten rule of uh, you know certain size. I, when I was hiring a talent, I I knew that Vince liked bigger guys. But so did Bill Watts, and so did Eddie Graham, and so did uh, Ole Anderson and all these other bookers. But they also could recognize talent and stars. comes They come in different packages, different sizes, di different ethnicities, the whole nine yards. So I think that they've relaxed that somewhat there. I think that there's a, as you, you laid it out, I mean, there's a lot of guys in, NXT that are we're going to be players that are not six four, and I have no issues with that. I I just think that if you have the it factor, the char the charisma, that intangible that cannot be taught, and you are able to uh, relate to your uh, audience base, uh, then uh, you're on your way to becoming successful. The good thing about I think when they come out of NXT. Especially guys like uh, Kevin Steen, now Kevin Owens, is that they have a good foundation from the Indies, uh, and then they get refined in Orlando, and then you you leave Orlando and you go out on the road to a non-Florida audience that's watching the the NXT show on the WWE Network, and they're finding a marketplace for it. Uh, they're new, they're fresh. They haven't been over over uh, exposed. I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant move, and I think the other thing that's been really smart about that is that, and I've always said this, and that's why I used to book guys when I started the developmental system in the nineties. Uh, one thing I would do is I, I would send guys to go down and spend a week or whatever, ten days, two weeks, that were not 
uh, booked, but they were experienced because it's very simple. You, a rookie cannot get better working with another rookie. They can do a little things. They can. Is it bad? No, it's not bad, but it's not nearly as viable as a rookie working with someone with uh, with with experience. That's how you get better. And the other way you get better is you add that new audience, paying customer, new audience element to it. So what WWE is doing is they're running these NXT tours, which I think is great, and they're booking some veterans who aren't booked and are available on these tours to help with, A, name identity and some box office uh, pop, but they're in the ring with some uh, with some of these younger guys, which is going to help the younger guys immensely. So I think it's a very smart thing, and uh, uh, how often they do it or how they manage it or, or things like that, because you're not going to, you're probably not going to see them touring every week, Fred, because they got to still train. They still got to go through practice. They still got to go to the, to the workouts. And if you're on the road every week, it's really going to limit the opportunity for them to get back in the ring and work on, you know, the ideal thing would be go have a, go, go on a tour, three or four day tour, uh, and then come back on what you, and on what you, uh, your deficiencies, uh, were on that tour. So it's a good thing. And the NXT brand itself is, is the future of WWE. It, it, there's no division in the company that is more important than the talent division, how they're managed, how they're trained, uh, and so forth. So I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of NXT and I really hope that, uh, the next, the, well, it has to be. The next generation of WrestleMania main eventers are going to come to NXT at some point in time. Now, with all due respect to Paul Levesque, I think he's doing a, a great job as far as I'm managing the talent and everything in NXT, mentoring them. But he's the head of talent relations, and if I'm not mistaken, that also applies to the main roster. And granted, he doesn't have the final say. He just got voted on the board of directors. Not, as, But, you know, he, he's not the main guy yet. It's still Vince McMahon. There's Kevin Dunn. There's other people around Vince McMahon. And I look at the main roster, and... Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I feel like they're almost having the same problem TNA had a few years back, albeit on a smaller scale, where slowly but surely outside of your Cena's, your Reigns, maybe your Bryan's and Ambrose's, everybody just seems to become another guy due to the 50-50 booking, wins and losses, and titles not meaning as much. I, I mean, if you're in Triple H's position, is there really anything he can do on his end? I mean, I know he's doing a great job with developmental, but I mean, at, at the end of the day, the main roster is what brings in the real money and what keeps funding the performance center and everything else he, he's trying to do at NXT. I mean, what can be done? And do you think he's doing everything he can right now to rectify whatever's going on with the main roster? Yeah, well, you got to remember that uh, as good a job as, as uh, Paul is doing in NXT, you know, he doesn't call the final shots. Uh, and there's only one man that calls the final shots in WWE, no matter what division it's in. And that's Vince McMahon. And, uh, uh, I, and, and booking is a philosophical thing. There's a lot of different ways. You know, I worked for several bookers and several, uh, guys in that role in my 40 year career. Some better than others, obviously, just like some coaches or the NBA are better than others. Um, we're in March, we're in the height now of March madness. And, uh, we see that there are certain coaches that are trained are mentally, uh, attuned to this time of the year. Uh, they're the ones that get their teams to peak late if they can, and they're the ones that make good coaching decisions uh, as far as when, managing clock management and things of that nature. Uh, I'm not a fan of 50-50 booking because I don't think that – and not, this is not a Paul Levesque uh, uh, knock or a Vince McMahon knock. It's just a, 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 a opinion is that – I think every match should be in, should have a reason, and every match should be uh, booked to to advance someone in it uh, more than one. If you're smart enough and they're skilled enough to do it, uh, I don't think you necessarily have to win a match to, to quote unquote uh, impress the fans and get over. Uh, I think it's all in the performance and how how the match is strategized. But I'm not a fan of fifty fifty booking. I like for the fans to either be 
angry with the outcome or happy with the outcome, but never benign. I, you know, I don't. I'm not a. I'm not a fan of uh, neutral. I and I'm not. In other words, don't be Geneva. Don't be Switzerland. Uh, don't be neutral. Uh, give me. Let me be angry that my favorite lost, or be happy that he won. And uh, because those are definitive emotions that you can build upon, at, vis-a-vis the uh, I beat you, and then you beat me up after the match. So what did we accomplish? I don't know what we accomplished there uh, uh, totally. So, but I, that's a philosophy, and a lot of that is uh, uh, is, is a because that there are fewer main event level talents that you don't want. You want to make sure that you are not uh, your main your your maintenance is good with those guys. You know, my point is you got to get somebody the ball, you got to get somebody the carries, and you got to see where they're going to go. I think that's a lot like the Roman Reigns situation right now. What was harder for you to do the first time? Podcasting, your one-man show, or commentary? Uh, probably uh, the one-man show. The uh, commentary, I had, I, Bill Watts is a great mentor, and I had been preparing myself my entire life to be a, a sportscaster. Uh, that's what I always wanted to be. That was my goal as a little kid. Uh, listen to all the great sportscasters I could get on my transistor radio, namely Jack Buck and Harry Carey. But I listened to all the greats. You know, I was I was born in a great era where I could listen to Keith Jackson and Chris Schenkel and Kurt Gowdy and Ray Scott, uh, among others. Some were all in Madden, of course. Uh, those guys were all uh, uh, great role models for me to learn from but uh so the play-by-play and the commentary uh, it felt natural it felt like i was ready i've been preparing since i was a little kid to do that gig and then bill watts was so good at uh helping me know what to say and then more importantly what not to say and what descriptors and adjectives use for a baby face for a heel all the science of broadcasting uh the podcast was an extension of that. I'd done a lot of radio. I'd done Atlanta Falcon radio. I'd done college football radio. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd been a guest on hundreds of radio shows. So once I got the format down on how I was going to do my podcast, that was cool. But when you go out in front of a live audience and you don't have a net and you're doing humor, uh, doing humor is hard. And, uh, you know, so sometimes people don't laugh, and it can take you out of your game. But uh, and then what stories are 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 are, are marketable? What stories are money? And which ones aren't? So uh, the the one man show was the hardest thing. And now when I'm out doing them, they're the they're they're the most fun thing that I do because of the same reason that they were so challenging. I'm in front of a live audience, and it reconnects me to the fan base, uh, which I love. And it's supported me in all my projects over the years. So uh, I, I'm a, I'm a big uh, I, I'm a I'm a big fan of getting better at anything I do. And yeah, I have fun. You know, you, you, you it's it's invigorating to be. People have questions, and I don't like you said. I don't. Those questions are uncensored. You know, you're going to pay the money to come see me. Uh, tickets for that uh, Gramercy Theater show start at twenty five bucks. So it's not like it's a uh, you got to break the bank to come, and uh, so if you're going to come enjoy the show, and you're going to participate in the Q and A, you should be able to ask whatever you want on any topic, and I don't shy away from anything. So uh, uh, that's, but you know, I'm, I'm having fun doing it. It's it's reconnecting me with the uh, live audience, and it's like the Rock, you know, and I talk uh, from time to time, and it's the same thing. The reason he comes back and works uh, in WWE is not for a payday. Uh, he, he loves that adrenaline rush and that, uh, uh, you know, that closeness to the live audience. It's so uh, different than filming movies where you have multiple takes and so forth and so on. So he's, uh, then that, and we are on the same page there. You just, you can't replicate how great it feels to be, uh, uh, you know, around your fans and your friends and 
people have supported you and that uh, they really want to be there. So it's it's infectious for me, and and I, I, I'm uh, I'm having a great time with it. So and and I and hopefully we'll you know I, I like to think I you know I, I'm uh, some of that Austin Rousey s perfectionist. I, I, there are things I work on, and I reevaluate what I do, and I, I think I get better at what I, at, at those presentations. At least that's the goal. I've never thought, well, I, that was a perfect show. If I just do, if I do that show every night, I'll be really, really happy. I'm not there yet, so it's always a work in progress. And I'm sure being in the New York area, I mean, SummerSlam has taken place in New Jersey multiple times at the old Continental Airlines Arena, now the IZOD Center, which is uh, closed down. Uh, MSG, of course. Uh, what SummerSlam memories come to mind being in the New York area? Well, SummerSlam memories? Yeah, as far as like you know, Undertaker versus Austin, uh, Highway to Hell, everything they had going on there. I, uh, you know, I, uh, gosh, that's hard, Fred, because I, it, I had to go back and look at, you know, there's, I did so many uh, events. The, the, the thing in general, the audience uh, is always seemingly emotionally invested. Uh, the New York audience, and I think that's cool. They if they don't sit on their hands. They generally let you know how they feel, even if they don't like something. Uh, I like the fact that they'll let you know they don't like that. Uh, but uh, you know, and Austin and uh, Undertaker had a epic match. They never had the greatest chemistry working with each other. That uh, uh, and it's just a clash of styles. They both like the hell out of each other, and they both have great, I mean, immense respect for each other. But it was just that, you know, they say styles make fights, and they're both their styles were just didn't, uh, I don't think, ever resonated uh, to the degree that they resonated with other people. And again, it wasn't a personal issue, just, you know, uh, it's just the yin and the yang didn't quite uh, connect, in my view. Did they have stinkers? No, of course not. But you know, you you just the the expectations for an Austin Undertaker uh, knockdown drag out were so high that I don't know that they or anybody else could have lived up to the expectations. But SummerSlam is always, uh, you know, it's especially this year uh, with it leaving LA. You know, WWE is going to do all they can to make it a a massive, you know, the summer the summertime WrestleMania event, so to speak. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Tune in next week for our special Comic-Con edition of TSC News with NYCC right around the corner.